and y'all let them know one time how much you appreciate them. There you go. Good deal. Well, are you guys ready for a little Bible study this morning? Say yes. And uh, John's Gospel, chapter 19, is where we find ourselves. We are in a series right now entitled Hope. I'm really looking forward to uh, the Sunday after Easter as well. I'm going to start a new series called This Is Us. It really is a family series. So we'll talk a little bit about marriage. Uh, also looking at the opportunity to talk a little bit about parenting. How many of you know some folks need some help on parenting? Can I get a witness? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay if you say yes. All right. So anyway, we'll have a great time with that as well. But just so you and I are on the same page, we remember that hope really does have two major definitions. There's a cultural hope. That's the... uh, The hope of uncertainty, that's when we're not real sure something's going to happen, but we hope that it works out just right. And then there is biblical hope. And you'll remember our definition of biblical hope really is a confident expectation of things to come. And the reason you and I need hope is because we are born sinners, and sin separates us from our Creator who is God. And without a relationship with the eternal God, you and I live a hopeless life. We live a life separated from Him without any purpose whatsoever. And so in order for you and I to have hope, we need a relationship with the Lord. But in order for you and I to have that relationship, Jesus, God's Son, had to walk a very brutal path. And in John's Gospel, chapter 19, what we really do is pull the curtain back on what exactly happened to the Lord Jesus Christ so that He might offer you and I hope. Now, what we've learned so far are some truths about Jesus. We have seen together that Jesus was scourged, He was hated, he was humiliated, but he was also obedient. And you and I saw that together in the first message in this particular series. And then last week, whenever we were together, we talked about the reality that Jesus Christ was indeed crucified. He was rejected, he was naked, but he was compassionate, and he was also triumphant. You'll remember Jesus from the cross, the last words that he said were to telestai, which literally means it is finished. And what he was doing really was giving a voice of triumph because he had paid the penalty that you and I deserve for our sins. It is finished, literally means paid in full. And so today as we look at scripture, what we are reminded of is the fact that God himself, the Father, was in total control of every single event that happened in the life of his son, Jesus Christ. In fact, the scripture teaches us in Isaiah in the Old Testament, as he prophesied about the coming Messiah, he makes a statement that has always uh, been both intriguing and also a little awkward to me. Uh, The Bible says that the Lord was pleased in crushing his son. And whenever I read that in Isaiah chapter 53, I, I think to myself, how could God the Father find pleasure in crushing his own son? And really what that is, is it is a prophecy of the fact that Jesus Christ in the flesh would receive the full just wrath of God. And in that, God found pleasure. And the amazing thing is whenever you study this, you run across so many different ideologies concerning the pleasure of God. But the greatest statement I found really uh, is a quote, which I'm going to give to you. It's on the screen here where an individual said, God's pleasure in his name and his pleasure in his doing good to sinners meet and marry in his pleasure in bruising his own son. Now I want you to think for just a moment about that particular statement and really what it's saying. God's pleasure in his name and his pleasure in doing good to sinners meet and marry in his pleasure in bruising his own son. Now the reality is when Jesus bore in his body the wrath of God, in that particular moment, God's wrath was being satisfied. And as a result of that satisfaction, meaning sin now had been judged, you'll remember God was holding back His just wrath for quite some time, but whenever He unleashed it upon His Son, uh, there was a sense of satisfaction because now it had been paid. And as a result, there's great pleasure in paying that particular sacrificial statement. Now today, as we jump into God's Word together, we continue to ask the question, what did Jesus have to endure to offer us hope? Whenever we left last, Jesus had just died. But John's Gospel, chapter 19, uh, beginning in verse 31, I want us to walk through the remainder of this chapter and see what they did with the body of Jesus. So with that in mind, would you stand with me in honor of God's Word? And you got it there in front of you, say yes. So the Bible says, then the Jews 
because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Let's pray together. Father, this morning as we come just into the very beginning verse of this passage of Scripture, uh, God, this is most definitely a weighty subject. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would take your word this morning and open our eyes to your glory found in the face of your Son, the Lord Jesus. And God, would you allow us to see a fresh and anew, really reviving our own hearts, stirring up our affections for you as we look at what Jesus did indeed endure for our sake. And Father, I pray that we would, as a result of this, find great motivation in our own hearts to make sure that we are telling this story to others, that they might come to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Missing hell and making heaven. Lord, we give you this time. I pray that you would speak through me. God, my heart and mind. Give me single-minded attention on what you desire to be said this morning. And we'll give you glory for it. And that's in Christ's name that we pray and everybody said, amen, amen. So you're seated this morning. So the key question, what exactly did Jesus have to endure to offer us hope? Just two things I want to encourage you to jot down this morning. First of all, jot down that Jesus was sacrificed. Jesus was sacrificed. Again, in verse 31, the Bible says, Then the Jews, because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Now, the Jewish believers who had witnessed the scene were motivated to remove Jesus' body from the cross at Calvary because it was the day of preparation. Now, very quickly, the day of preparation uh, really points to Friday. Friday was the day of preparation every Friday in the life of a Jewish person. And the reason it was the day of preparation is because they were preparing for Saturday, which was the Sabbath. So there was a whole lot of work that an individual had to go through in order to make sure that there was no work to be done on Saturday, which was the Sabbath. And so here in this text of Scripture, they wanted to take the body down of the Lord Jesus Christ because it was Friday. They did not want the body of Jesus to remain on the cross. Now that begs the question, why? Because whenever you and I really study crucifixion in the Roman Greco era, oftentimes bodies were stayed upon a cross for weeks at a time. Uh, they were stayed upon a cross until the, uh, literally the birds of the air would come and eat their flesh. So why were the Jews concerned about the body of the Lord Jesus Christ and taking him down off of the cross? And the answer is pretty simple. Uh, in the Old Testament, there is actually a statement that is given to us in the law of Moses that talks about the importance of making sure that someone's body does not remain hanged upon a tree. In fact, I give this to you on the screen. It's in Deuteronomy 21, verse 22 through 23. Listen to this. If a man has committed a sin worthy of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree. Now notice the next phrase. His corpse shall not hang all night on the tree, but you shall surely bury him on the same day. For he who is hanged on a tree is accursed of God. Now pay very close attention to that one phrase there. He who is hanged on a tree is accursed of God, so that you do not defile your land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. So here in the text of Scripture in John's Gospel, the Bible teaches you and I that because of our sins, we are actually cursed by the law of God. Uh, that is, we are guilty because every single one of us have broken God's law. So Jesus came to be for us what we did not desire to be for ourselves, and that is accountable to the law. So Jesus bore in his body the just wrath of God for our sin. As a matter of fact, Jesus on the cross at Calvary became a curse for us. Listen to what Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. The Bible says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. So again, Jesus Christ was upon the cross bearing the curse 
that you and I deserve. Can somebody say amen for that? But then secondly, we do know that the Jewish people, those, as we'll see in just a moment, that were believers, wanted the body of Jesus to be taken down off of the cross immediately so that it would not be on there all night because they knew the law of Moses and they knew if the body stayed, it would bring defilement upon the entire land. And obviously they were there in Jerusalem at that time to celebrate the Passover and the last thing they wanted was to bring defilement upon the the people of God. So following the crucifixion, it is actually customary for those who have been nailed to a tree to have their legs broken in order to speed up death. Uh, they would take, that is the Roman executioners, they would take a large club and they would use it to shatter the legs of those who were crucified to keep them from being able to push up. You remember when they were on the tree, the only way that they really could get a breath is if they either pulled themselves up by their arms, which, by the way, were all dislocated as a result of the pressure upon them, or they would push up from their legs, which were nailed to the tree, in order to gasp and grasp some air. And so ultimately, when the Roman executioners came and broke the legs, it would basically take away the ability for anyone to push up. And so they would immediately suffocate and they would die. But as they approached Jesus, something interesting occurred because they saw that Jesus had already died. And this is verse 32 and 33 in your Bibles. So the soldiers came. They broke the legs of the first man and of the other who was crucified with him. But coming to Jesus, whenever they saw that he was already dead, did not break his legs. Verse 36, for... And this is huge. For these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture that not a bone of him shall be broken. Now, John, again, as he's writing this particular gospel, the good news, his account of Jesus' life, he is seeing in the crucifixion and even in the death of Jesus a great fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And one of those uh, prophetic statements uh, really concerned the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb in the Old Testament was taken and was offered up by Jewish people to celebrate uh, God's redemption of the Israelites from Egyptians' bondage. You'll remember they would uh, slay the lamb, they would take the blood of the lamb, place it over the doorpost of their homes, and when God sent the death angel through Egypt to kill the firstborn, the death angel, seeing the blood, would pass over. And so every single day after this great Uh, work of God, or every single year rather, they would celebrate the Passover time and they would continue with the lamb and they would eat that lamb in their homes. Now, I want you to listen to what Exodus 12, 46 teaches you and I about the lamb that was offered up at Passover. The Bible says the lamb is to be eaten in a single house. You're not to bring forth any flesh outside of the house. Now, notice the next little phrase here. Nor are you to break any bone of it. Now there's another in Numbers chapter 9 and verse 12. The Bible says this. They shall leave none of the lamb until morning, nor break a bone of it. According to all the statute of the Passover, they shall observe it. Now I bought an eyeball for just a moment. The Old Testament Passover lamb really was a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ who would come as our full and final Passover lamb. In fact, the scriptures teach us this on many occasions, but John the Baptist says of Jesus when he sees him coming, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Paul the Apostle also writes in the book of Corinthians that Jesus is our Paschal Lamb or our Passover Lamb. Now remember the Old Testament, they said you cannot have a lamb with bones that are broken. And so Jesus on the cross at Calvary, being your Passover Lamb and my Passover Lamb, also had to remain in such a fashion that no bones were broken. And it is the hand of God itself, the Father, overseeing the entire crucifixion, realizing that Jesus Christ is the Lamb that He had sent to the earth. And He was going to make absolutely certain that Jesus, His Son, fulfilled every single Old Testament prophecy and every single Old Testament picture. And so when the Roman executioners came to Jesus, they saw immediately that Jesus was already dead, and they chose not to break his legs. Now, on one hand, we look at that and we think, oh my goodness, the Roman soldiers chose not to break the legs of Jesus because he is already dead. And that is true, but the reality is he was already dead because God had already crushed him. And it was absolutely essential 
that not a bone was to be broken. Which, by the way, can, can we just say amen to God being sovereign over this whole thing? Yeah? This is an amazing concept as you begin to look at the Scripture, seeing what the Lord really has done for you and I. Turning your attention back to verse 34, the Bible says, But one of the uh, soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling truth, so that you also may believe. Now, very quickly, as you and I look at this text of Scripture, uh, one thing that indeed stands out is this statement here. The soldiers pierced his side with a spear. And then as you look at this text of Scripture, you can see that there is someone giving testimony. And John, in like fashion throughout the entirety of the gospel, never really brings himself to the forefront. And so here as he's talking about someone giving a testimony, he's actually talking about himself. And John is saying, listen, I was there. And I saw the soldiers not break the legs of Jesus, but take a spear and shove it into his side. And when this occurred, we saw blood and water come out of it. Now, why is it that John really felt it was essential to major on this particular fact in the Scripture? At least two major reasons. One, there was a false doctrine about Jesus already being taught within the early church. There were individuals who came from uh, doctrines known as docetism and Gnosticism who actually believed that the flesh of a person was evil but their soul was good or their spirit was good. And so they began to say that Jesus was indeed good, godly, and he was holy. And therefore, because of their messed up view of humanity, they said there's no way Jesus could have had flesh because if he had flesh, he would have been evil. Now, the reason that this is so vitally important is because the Bible says for the wages of sin is death. And if Jesus did not have a body, he could not have died. And so John, in this text of Scripture, is saying, My testimony is true. I was there. I saw the spear go into his side, and blood and water came out. What he's really doing is he is elevating the fact that indeed Jesus had a body. Isn't that interesting, by the way? I always find this interesting as I look at, you know, early uh, doctrines that were heretical. Uh, the reason this is interesting to me is because they were arguing that Jesus was great, good, and holy. And therefore, there's no way he could have had, you know, flesh because we believe flesh is evil. That's what they were arguing. Those who saw and heard Jesus, they argued he was good. He only appeared to be real. But if you kind of fast forward to where we are today, what do people argue today? Well, Jesus was just a man. There's no way he was good, holy. No way he was God. It's amazing how it just kind of totally turns. But the reality of what John is doing here is he's elevating the fact that Jesus did indeed die and his side was pierced. And I want you to know that, are y'all listening and say yes? Even the, even the piercing of the side of Jesus was a direct application of the sovereignty of God in this entire situation. The reason we say that is because God prophesied through Zechariah in the Old Testament. Again, chapter 12 and verse 10, the Bible says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication so that, notice this next little phrase, they will look on me whom they have pierced. Now what is this? This is a prophetic statement about the coming Messiah. Zechariah is literally writing this down. And it is the Lord himself who is saying, they will, they're going to look on me whom they have pierced. That is a foreshadowing of exactly what John is talking about here in John's Gospel, chapter 19. As a matter of fact, John, uh, the revelator, wrote about this in Revelation 1 and verse 7. He said, Behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who, what does that say up there? Pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, so it is to be. So Zechariah was talking about the death of the Messiah on the cross. And they would look upon him whom they have pierced. And John in Revelation says, you know what? When Jesus comes back to the earth to redeem his people Israel, Israel is going to look upon the Lord Jesus Christ and they're going to see the one that they pierced. All of this, again, is just a fulfillment of what God and his entire plan really was. It's amazing. Jesus was 
a sacrifice. And let me just say it this way. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. Would you agree with that? Say amen. And aren't you glad this morning that when we come, we come and we remember what Jesus did? I mean, could you imagine if we lived in the time frame where you had to bring a lamb or you had to bring a bull and you had to offer that up as a sacrifice for your sin and inside this place it would be completely bloody as we were trying to worship and come to God? Well, we don't do that now because Jesus came and he paid the ultimate price for our sin. And as a result of that, when we come, we remember now what he did. Somebody say amen on that? Second truth, jot this one down. Jesus was buried. Jesus was buried. Uh, The following uh, verses introduce us uh, to two individuals who played a major role in the burial of Jesus. In verse 38, we meet a guy named Joseph. Notice the scripture. Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission. So he came and he took away his body. Now, what do you and I really know about this guy, Joseph of Arimathea? A couple of things. Matthew's gospel teaches you and I that Joseph was indeed a rich man, so he was well off. We learn from Luke's gospel that Joseph was a member of the Sanhedrin. Now, this is interesting because it was the Sanhedrin that brought Jesus to be crucified. But amazingly, we learn in the gospels that Joseph of Arimathea, being even a member of the Sanhedrin, did not agree with bringing Jesus before Pilate to be crucified. Many scholars believe that he was indeed an individual who had placed his trust in Jesus. And this gives evidence to that fact as he was coming to take away the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then as we approach verse 39, we meet up with a guy named Nicodemus. Verse 39, the Bible says, Nicodemus who had first come to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds uh, weight. Now, I bought a, I bought a, you guys know that this is basically what they used to prepare a body for burial. So they would wrap that body in linen. They would put all of these particular spices on the body, typically to cover up the stench. That's the reason why. And then they would place that body inside the tomb. But here we see an individual by the name of Nicodemus. And what I love here is what John does. Uh, I highlighted this word night on purpose. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night. That actually refers back to John's Gospel, chapter 3. And in John's Gospel, chapter 3, you know what we read? We read, Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. Now, as you study through John's Gospel, you'll see oftentimes that John uses uh, this contrast between night and uh, day, between darkness and light. And so when Nicodemus was coming to Jesus in John's Gospel, chapter 3, by night, there's no doubt externally it was dark, But it was also a reflection of his own internal condition. He was dark. He was separated from God. He did not have a relationship with the Lord. So Jesus says to Nicodemus, after Nicodemus, by the way, and you know, really does encourage Jesus. He said, You got got to talk to me because nobody can do the things that you are doing unless he's sent by God. And so Nicodemus, wanting to learn more from Jesus, Jesus says, listen, anyone who wants to enter into the kingdom of God must be born again. And whenever this particular statement was given to Nicodemus, those of you who have read this before, you know Nicodemus thought, how in the world is that going to happen, right? How can a person get back into their mother's womb and be born again? And I read that and I'm just like, who, who wants to do that, amen? That's weird. And Nicodemus saw that as completely off, completely weird. And then Jesus says, listen, you've got to be born of water. You've got to be born of the Spirit in order to enter the kingdom of God. And what Jesus is doing is saying born of water speaks about your first birth. Born of the Spirit speaks about your second birth. He's saying you've got to be born again from above. And whenever you're born again from above, that's when your life is changed. And I love what Jesus says to Nicodemus. And there's no doubt in my mind that when Nicodemus was witnessing the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, that this verse, this statement from Jesus had to flood his soul. Listen to what Jesus says to Nicodemus. Have it for you on the screen as well. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. 
Now, come here. we got a lot of pictures we're trying to run through. you got this uh, serpent, right? Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. What is that all about? Well, in the Old Testament, God actually sent serpents to bite the children of Israel as a result of their sin. And whenever these serpents came in and they bit the children of Israel, they would die not long after that. But God said to Moses, what I want you to do is fashion a serpent in bronze. And whenever you hold up that serpent, after they have been bitten, you say, look at a serpent. And everyone who looks to the serpent will be absolutely set free. They will be uh, cured of their disease. Are you all with me Say yes? So now, again, everything in the Old Testament is a picture of Jesus to come. And Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And what is the picture here? Jesus is talking about his own crucifixion. And so Jesus on the cross at Calvary was indeed lifted up. And what does Jesus say? And whoever believes in him will have eternal life. See, you and I at birth have been bitten by sin. And just as the serpent's bite would cause someone to die in the Old Testament, the bite of sin causes you and I to die. And the only way that we can be set free from that is if we look to the cross at Calvary. And when we look at Jesus and by faith believe that His death was paying for our sin and we trust in Him, in that moment we are set free from the disease of sin. Somebody say amen. This is what happens when you look to the Lord Jesus. (laughs) And I, you know, as I think about that too, are y'all with me? There's a lot that ends up flooding my mind. That's why I prayed for focus this morning. But, But can you imagine Moses holding up the serpent? How ridiculous that would have been. I mean, he's made a bronze serpent. He's holding it up. It's like, if y'all look at this, you'll live. And there's no doubt some people had to have been like, Moses has lost his mind. Does he see what's happened to us? What does he mean? Look at that serpent. That is ridiculous. But isn't it true that that's what people say about the cross? And yet Paul the Apostle tells us in the New Testament that it is the foolishness of the preaching of Christ that saves. And what do we do today? We say, hey, look to Jesus and you'll be saved. Look to Christ and you'll be saved. He who was lifted up on the cross to bear the weight of your sin and the just wrath of God upon his body. Look to Christ. And people say, that's ridiculous. But the amazing thing is that everybody who thought that it was ridiculous in the Old Testament died. And everybody who thinks it's ridiculous to look to Christ in our day will also die and be separated from God forever. But for those who look, are you listening? For those who look, something divine occurs. The Bible tells us in the book of Colossians that he, that is Jesus, rescues us from the domain of darkness. And I love that statement. He rescues us from the domain of darkness. Real quick, ladies and gentlemen, are y'all listening? Yeah? When Nicodemus came to Jesus, he came to him. Was it light or dark? Dark. It explained his external condition, but it also explained his internal condition. But whenever you trust in Jesus, you're transferred, rescued from the domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And I'm absolutely convinced that Nicodemus had left the spiritual darkness and he had entered into the light of Jesus Christ, God's son. He'd been born again. And then as we roll, and by the way, if you look to Jesus, guess what? You are also redeemed. You're taken out of darkness, put in the light. Hey, hey, have you ever been to one of those, uh, you know, you go to, I think they got them right over here at Papa's Pizza in Claremont. I think that's our only restaurant we have now. But anyways, if you go to Papa's Pizza, they got one of those little deals in there with a claw. You pay a bunch of money and you try to win the animal inside. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I don't, every time I read Colossians, uh, that passage of Scripture in Colossians, I always think about that claw. And I know there's nothing spiritual about this. Are you with me? But for some reason, this comes to my mind because, you know, I think about, you know, that claw. And I've done it a few times and realized, hey, <laughs> this is impossible. So anyway, but, but you're trying to grab it. But, but that's what God did to me. When I put, listen, I was sitting in a church service similar to this. And all of a sudden, I realized I needed Christ. And I, by faith, trusted in Jesus. And it was as if God himself reached down and just grabbed me up. 
and picked me up out of the darkness and brought me over and put me into the kingdom of his beloved son. That's what God does. And he does that all because of what Jesus has done. Now back to our text, verse 40 through 42. They took the body of Jesus. They bound it in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. One commentator noted, the burial of Jesus is a part of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 4 tells you and I that he was indeed buried. It is significant uh, because there is a fact that it reminds you and I of the completion of Jesus' suffering and humiliation. It also pointed up to the reality of his death and set the stage for his coming bodily resurrection. Also in Jesus' burial, he identified with believers who will die and be buried. And you may wonder if it's really important to us that Jesus was buried. The answer uh, holds great theological significance. Death, I kind of alluded to this already, but let me give it to you again. Uh, death is the sentence pronounced on sinners, and death is required for atonement. So if Jesus had not died, we would have no assurance that the demands of God's law were met in Christ. We would have no foundation for believing that we were at peace with the Father. So the account of Jesus' burial in today's passage is more than just a record of historical fact. Christ's burial proved that he truly died and that he endured the curse for his people. As the scripture says here, therefore because of the Jewish day of preparation since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This is interesting too. I, there's so, there's so, have, y'all, have y'all been amazed? I don't know why my voice cracked right there, but listen to me. Have y'all been amazed at how the Bible just it just comes together in so many different manners. It's like God is just definitely weaving this phenomenal story for you and I to see of his son Jesus. When we look at this, he was buried. He, he was crucified in a garden. He was buried in a garden. Now, I'd never thought about this before until I ran across this quote by Matthew, Matthew Henry. And um, I, I want you to listen to this quote. We've got it for you on the screen as well. Uh, look at this. In the Garden of Eden... Are y'all with me? In the Garden of Eden, death and the grave first received their power. Now, I about, I about why, why, why did death and the grave first receive their power? Because Adam and Eve had sinned. And now, in a garden, they are conquered. He's talking about Jesus now. Disarmed and triumphed over. In a garden, Christ began his passion. And from a garden, he would rise. And he would begin his exaltation. Y'all seeing what my man Matthew's getting at? He's saying it was in a garden that sin came into the world and death with it. But it was also in a garden where sin and death had been conquered by Jesus. So many phenomenal things in our scriptures that point to who Christ is and what he has done. And it is because of what Jesus Christ has done that you and I can have hope. Amen? Let's bow together. Father, thank you for your son who was sacrificed. Thank you as well for your son who was buried. And Lord, I pray as we walk through this week, often known as Holy Week, that we walk with our eyes upon you. That we do as Paul the Apostle teaches us, we, we set our minds on things above, not on earthly things. But Lord, would you... Just revive our hearts where we have become stale concerning the death of our Savior, Jesus. Lord, would you lay upon us the weightiness of what occurred over 2,000 years ago at the cross. Lord, would you also speak to those who are present today who have not yet trusted in your Son. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed, if you're here this morning and you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, let me encourage you right where you sit, to place your faith in him. It was Jesus who died for you. Jesus who was raised again. It was Jesus, and it is Jesus alone, that can offer you hope. 
confident expectation of great things to come. So if you're here today and you need to trust in Christ, let me encourage you right where you are. Would you just pray something like this as I pray out loud? Just say, Lord, I'm a sinner. So today I'm turning from my sin, placing my trust in Jesus. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. And thank you for his resurrection. Now help me to be unashamed of who Jesus is. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed, if that's the prayer of your heart, the first step of obedience is baptism. So in just a moment, we're going to stand to our feet and begin to sing. And as we sing, I'll be here in the front, others as well. We want to encourage you to leave the place where you've been seated and come forward. We want to pray for you, encourage you along. Really want to set up a time for you to be baptized. Baptism, as you go in public with your faith, you showing that you are not ashamed of who Jesus is. And we're celebrating that in our next two services. We'd love to set up a time in the days ahead for you to celebrate it as well. So in just a moment when we stand to our feet, let me encourage you to come. God may be calling you to join this church family. If that's the case, you come as well. But let me talk to all of us in the house. With heads bowed, eyes closed, we have individuals that we've been praying for who are far from God. We have individuals that we wrote their names on these boards that talk about hope. These are people who do not know the Lord, and if they die, they spend eternity separated from God in hell. But this morning, I want to encourage you to make sure that you are intentional about inviting them to celebrate Easter with us. Inviting them to come into a personal relationship with Christ. Don't miss that this week. Father, help us just to meditate this week on all that your son Jesus did so that we might have hope. We give you this time of invitation. We trust that you'll work. And that's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. And while we sing this morning, you come.